But in 1948, when things looked hopeless for Eckert and Morkley's company, help came from a most unlikely source. Riders up. The American Totalizator Company, makers of the mechanical equipment that calculated odds and displayed the winnings at racetracks, was headed by Harry Strauss. A man of vision, Strauss foresaw the day when computers might replace his totalizator equipment. To hedge his bets, Strauss purchased a 40% interest in Eckert Morkley, injecting desperately needed funds into the company. For the next year, the Eckert Morkley Computer Company underwent rapid expansion. The staff increased from 40 to 134. But this prosperity would be short lived. Eckert and Morkley's last best hope vanished when Harry Strauss died in a plane crash in October 1949. One month later, Strauss's partners notified Eckert and Morkley they wanted out of the computer business. When they just wanted to get out of something which they regarded as a financial loss, they also didn't think it was going to work. They didn't have any faith in it as Mr. Strauss did. And so they encouraged us to get somebody else to buy the uh, idea out as soon as possible. Without backing, the Eckert Morkley Computer Company sank deeper into debt. The pair, who had started off with such high hopes, were forced to sell out to Remington Rand. Remington Rand sold a variety of products, including typewriters, filing cabinets, and punched card tabulating machines. But to the general public, they were best known for their electric shavers. James Rand, president of Remington Rand, liked to speculate in new ventures. He also wanted to gain a foothold in this new field of electronics. The brand name Univac from now on would belong not to Eckert and Morkley, but to Remington Rand. Under Remington Rand's label, the first Univac was finally delivered to the US Census Bureau, almost a year late and considerably over budget. It was America's first commercially built computer. It had only rated a back page story, little noticed by the general public. But within a year, the name Univac would be on the lips of millions of Americans, thanks to a brilliant public relations move by Remington Rand. Good evening, everyone. This is Walter Cronkite speaking to you from CBS Television Election Headquarters here in New York City. CBS were convinced that to win the lion's share of the election night audience, what they needed was a Univac computer in studio to forecast the result. Turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain Univac and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is the face of a Univac. A Univac is a fabulous electronic machine which we have borrowed to help us uh, predict this election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. Univac is going to try to predict the winner for us just as early as we can possibly get the returns in. For the first time, a computer was about to predict the outcome of an election. But first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the theory of this. This is not a joke or a trick. It's an experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know. We hope it'll work. At any rate, for the last... At 8 o'clock, Collingwood asked Univac to type out its prediction. Can you tell us uh, what your prediction is now on the basis of the returns that we've had so far? Have you got a prediction for us, Univac? I don't know. I think that Univac is probably an honest machine, a good deal more honest than a lot of commentators who are working, and he doesn't think he's got a, enough to tell us anything about yet. But we'll be back with him later in the evening. Now back to Walter What Trump. Collingwood didn't know was that Univac did have something to say, and this was it. Just before CBS went on the air, Univac predicted Eisenhower would beat Stevenson by a landslide. The problem was, no one believed it. The machine turned out this answer that they didn't believe. The polls were telling them that it was going to be about a 50-50 election, and we were telling them it's a landslide with only 5% of the vote. And they couldn't believe that you could predict the thing as accurately as we did, which was within a few percent, with only 5% of the vote. 
So everybody was thrown into total confusion. Uh, the Republic. Excuse me. The McCarthy... Uh, uh, but the confusion the wouldn't last long. 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 Votes were now pouring in for Eisenhower. Even before all the polls closed, it was clear that UNIVAC had been right all along. General Eisenhower was winning by the largest landslide in the nation's history. After midnight, CBS confessed to the public what had happened. You saw, as the prediction, as more votes came in, the odds came back, and it was obviously evident that we should have had nerve enough to believe the machine in the first place. It was right. We were wrong. Next year, we'll believe it. The next day, the headline said it all. The whole world had taken notice of UNIVAC. It wasn't long before UNIVAC began appearing in the movies. Like one of these machines where you push a button and it just does what you want it to do. I'm not a robot, I'm people. And I quit. While UNIVAC captured the attention of Hollywood, it was at last catching the eye of its intended customers. By the end of 1953, there were three UNIVACs installed and more orders were coming in. And there seemed to be no competition in sight, not even from Remington Rand's closest rival. Today, the name IBM is synonymous with computers. But in the 1940s, the company showed little interest in these new machines. IBM seemed content to stay with the punched card tabulating equipment that it had pioneered at the turn of the century. For 50 years, IBM had grown rich on a technology that would soon be rendered obsolete by electronic computers. At first, they didn't recognize it. But when the Census Bureau, who used hundreds of IBM's tabulators, ordered their UNIVAC, one IBM vice president became alarmed, Tom Watson, Jr. I'll never forget how I felt about the Eckert Monthly contract in the Census Bureau. I felt a sense of great panic and uh, went back to Washington, to New York City from Washington and uh, had a late night conference saying, look, we do, this is the beginning of the end for the IBM company unless we recognize it and do something about it. Thomas Watson, Jr. knew that IBM could lose everything to computers. But nothing was done at IBM without his father's approval. And Mr. Watson, Sr. saw no commercial future in these newfangled machines. But when I'd say, well, look, Dad, if we don't take this business, somebody else will take it for us because the we're now being pushed by the market. We're market driven. We're not driving the market. The market is driving us. We ought to try to get ahead of them. Some stormy sessions getting there, but at the end of the road, he was agreeable. When in 1951, IBM finally took its first steps into the computer age, some five years after Eckert and Morkley had begun building UNIVAC, it was with a scientific computer rather than a commercial one. However, the big new market wasn't in selling computers to scientists, but to businesses, and UNIVAC was slowly stealing away IBM's business customers. Within two years, the younger Watson had a free hand in the company. Thomas Watson Sr. finally stepped aside in favor of his son, who vowed to focus all his energy beating UNIVAC. And this was the inexpensive machine with which he launched his attack in 1953. Technologically, it seemed no match for the UNIVAC. Designed to run in conjunction with IBM's conventional punch card equipment, it was slow. But Watson had a secret weapon, which would compensate for any crudeness in the technology. The IBM sales force his dad had left him. Thomas Watson Sr. had had a ferocious approach to sales and a superb understanding of salesmen. He rewarded them with high commissions, pushed them with quotas, inspired them with speeches, educated them in classrooms and punished them if they didn't toe the line. And it worked. <laughs> 